Revelation 22, 4. We actually moved through Revelation much faster than I have gone through it before. But uh, maybe it's because it's the, I don't know, fifth or sixth time. But I always find something new and exciting. When we finish Revelation, Lord willing, I'm going to turn our attention over to Romans. And that's going to be a long study. Romans, there's so much in Romans. That's a long Romans road we'll be traveling down there. And I look forward to starting that in, you know, just shortly now. Uh, verse, chapter 22, verse 4 of Revelation. It's on. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their forehead. They shall see His face, and the name of Him shall be in the minds of them, literally. And they shall see His face means as believers, we are granted an audience with the King on a regular basis. How wonderful is that? You know, we're, we're kind of special people. We believe, and yet we haven't seen. But the time is coming when we are going to see our Savior face to face. And it's not that we can't see Him anytime. He's, he's there for us. We can see Him on a regular basis. Isn't that wonderful to think about that? You know, saved have a privilege. It's a privileged place before the throne and they shall see his face. I've often wondered about that. I've sat back and just thought what it's going to be like when you see Jesus face to face. Have you ever thought about it? I think you probably have. What's it going to be like? You know? And no matter how I think about it, I cannot possibly imagine. The implication is that we are under God's good favor and we're part of His inner circle. You remember when Jesus was ministering here on earth at His first coming, He had an inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And they accompanied Him in places where the other disciples didn't go. And when we get to heaven, we're part of that inner circle. We have the privilege of being with Him and seeing Him. There's an intimate relationship and that's indicated by the fact that His name shall be in the foreheads of them. In other words, our minds are going to be filled with Jesus. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do that today? But you know, our minds today are not the same. We, everything in the world just comes crashing in sometimes. And it pushes out the things that we want. No matter how hard we try, we can't focus on but one thing at a time. If I start thinking about this, I forget about what I was thinking about before. But the time's coming when we can focus on the Lord completely. You know, their freedom is to be in the presence of God indicates that they will then be in their glorified bodies. And what a day that's going to be when we have that glorified body. Oh, I think about every morning, the last couple of mornings especially, I have longed for that glorified body. Verse 5 says, And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You know, once again, John writes about the, the glory and light of the new Jerusalem will be the presence of God. No artificial illumination is needed. You won't have to turn on a light. You don't have to worry about street lights coming on. There's no night. Once again, a statement is made that the servants of God will reign with Christ forever and ever. That's the ages rolling over the ages, rolling over the ages. Wow. No sun, no need for the sun. And people say, well, how in the world? Well, God, all God has to do is say, let there be light. If you remember in creation, He said, let there be light. But yet He didn't set the sun in the sky then. It was later. All He has to do is say the word. He is the light. Jesus, I'm the light of the world. He'll be the light for all eternity. You know, that there be light. That was before He created the sun, the moon, the stars. God is light. And we're going to be living in the presence of that great light for all eternity. Now, for the next verses here from this verse 6 through 17, these are, to me, more comforting thoughts. You know, people are scared of the book of Revelation. They're, they're afraid of it. And yet there is a great deal of comfort for the believer. 
in Revelation. You know, my favorite portion of Revelation is back in chapter 4. Three little words that give me great comfort. Come up hither. Because it tells me something special. It tells me, you know, the, the, the other two chapters right before that talk about the church, the seven churches, right? It gives us an outline of church history following those seven churches. And then John says, after these things, after what things? After we see the history of the church, he hears the word, come up hither. And it gives me such comfort because I know that is telling us that when the time comes prior to that tribulation, the Lord's going to call us, come up hither. No matter what the problem is. And even if the rapture doesn't happen in our lifetime, we're still going to hear that call. On the day that we take our last breath and He calls us up, come up hither, come on to me. And it gives me comfort to know that. So there are a lot of comforting thoughts in Revelation. Verse 6 says, And He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angels to show unto His servants the things what, which must shortly be done. The things that are soon to happen. Now, shortly and soon, same thing here. And I know I've told you this story before, but it's important to get it in our minds about soon. Years ago, Dr. Couch, who was the president of my seminary, made his first trip to Israel. He's gone to be with the Lord now. But he made his first trip there. And he arrived in the afternoon and he went to the hotel and as he was checking in, he asked, when time was dinner? Soon. Okay. He said he went upstairs, he put his clothes out, took a shower, changed, came back down about an hour later. What time's dinner? Soon. Okay. He went out, did a little sightseeing, wandered around, came back a couple hours later. Dinner? Soon. Well, about 8.30 or 9 o'clock, they had dinner. He realized in the minds, soon does not mean like we think of it in America. Soon means if it doesn't happen in five minutes, we're upset. The state of mind is it's the next event to happen. That was the next event, that dinner. Now, what's the next event for us? The rapture of the church. That's the next event on God's prophetic calendar. Nothing has to happen. So the Lord says, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming soon. That doesn't mean he's coming in five minutes or 10 minutes or a day. He is coming to the next event. Many people say it's been 2,000 years. He's not coming back. Well, soon means the next event. Even if it's 3,000 or 4,000 years, it's the next event. I don't think it's going to be that long, but the Lord's coming back soon. That's what we need to remember. Don't worry about the American way of soon. Think about the biblical way, the next event. And those are the things that and you know, these things must shortly be done soon. These things are going to happen soon. Of course, the event that will trigger this is what? Come up hither. Going up. And here we see that it's confirmed both truth and the possibility of comprehending prophecies that's previously been given. The angel tells John that these sayings in the book are faithful, that is, they're trustworthy, and they're true. So many people don't believe the Bible. This angel just verified the fact that every word is faithful and is true, not just in Revelation, but from Genesis all the way through. It is the Word of God. And the purpose of these communications that John's been receiving is not to bewilder and confuse him or us. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's to reveal the things which must shortly be done. That, see, people don't look at the comfort in Revelation. Oh, they look at the horror. Well, I'll tell you, if I'm a lost person, it would scare the pants off me looking at what's coming here. As a believer, what it should do for us is to give us the heart to warn people that they need Jesus. And this directly contradicts the point of view of many scholars that the book of Revelation is... Uh, Oh, it, you just, it's, it's a mystery that we, we can't figure out. And there's no key available to us today. And that's a falsehood. This is the book of, it's the Word of God. And it's not some vague imagination of John. John didn't need some 
spicy Italian food and go to bed that night and dream this. This is true. And as we go through Revelation, the one thing we've seen, Scripture interprets Scripture. There's no mystery here except the things God wanted to remain a mystery. In addition, it's the intended to describe future events. That's the whole purpose of it. That was the purpose of all prophecy, to describe things that are going to happen. Many of the prophecies of Scripture have been fulfilled. Some are yet to be fulfilled as we see here. And when we take Revelation literally, take the ordinary meaning, and this is exactly what it does, and even though much of Revelation is written in symbolic form, it's very clear what he's talking about. The Word of God is not given to be obscure. It's given to be understood by those taught by the Spirit. If you go into the Bible, especially Revelation, a new believer should never open the book of Revelation and start reading and studying there. He doesn't have the background. He doesn't have the foundation. And a lost person study will never ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten the Word for him. And yes, it's going to be a mystery. If you don't know the Scripture, if you don't study, it is becomes mysterious to you. But for us, that we read and we study the Bible and we see the things, we understand. And Revelation, many times if you just keep reading, it tells you what he's talking about. As we've seen over these months of study. Verse 12. Uh, they're read in your Bible. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keep the, keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Here is the theme of Revelation stated again. Behold, I come quickly. I come soon. I'm coming. It's, when it does happen, it's going to happen quickly. Everything in Revelation, as we've talked about, when each plague begins, it's bang, 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 bang. And these things are coming. We're moving. We're on the express train now. We're moving fast toward these end times. I'm not setting dates. But if you look around the world, you see that things are pointing in that direction. When I was growing up, for example, you had little banks everywhere. Now, you notice the banks are beginning to merge into basically one. Won't be long. Governments want to form into one. Everything's moving in that direction of one world this, one world that, so the Antichrist can take over. Jesus said, He's coming quickly. The Greek word tarke may be interpreted soon or quickly. And it means to take place at a rapid rate when it begins. It falls into place in rapid order at a quick pace, rapid fire. And that's what happens in Revelation when we see that tribulation period. Bang, 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 bang. It's like watching an old western. Things happen so fast. From the divine standpoint, both are true. The coming of Christ is always soon from the standpoint of the saints' view of the future. And when it occurs, it's going to happen suddenly and quickly. When He comes from the church, we're looking for that. I hope you're looking for it. Anticipating at any moment. And when He comes, it's going to happen quickly. We're going to be gone so fast, it's going to be like some special effect in a movie. Boom. Gone. Well, what a day. What a day that'll be. As 1 Corinthians says, describing the rapture in a twinkling of an eye. Do you know that that's considered one one thousandth of a second? Wow, that's fast. Before I can get that out, I'm gone. One one, I'm gone before I can even get it out. That's how fast it takes place. According, accordingly, a special blessing is pronounced on those who believe and heed the prophecy of this book. And there are blessings. There's a lot of beatitudes in this book. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Well, that's wonderful. It is. You know what the Lord has said. You, you follow it. You believe it. Don't add to it. We're going to find out about that too. So many people want to add to this. They want to take what they see today and squeeze it in and say, well, this is what it means. Take the book. Take it literally. You know, John, who saw it, could not accurately describe what he sees. He says, it appears to be, it seems like. We don't need to add anything to it. Accept it as it is. You know, this is the last book of the Bible, and it's so neglected by the church. 
you know, if this meaning's being confused and by many expositors, contains promises of blessing, more, more promises of blessing than any book in Scripture. This reference to blessing is the sixth of the attitude of the book. The seventh is going to be in verse 14. The first blessing is similar to the one in 22.7. We'll see when we saw early, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this book. Now in verse 8 and 9, we read that, and I, John, saw these things. What he's doing right there, it's like he's standing in court. He's holding up his hand. I, John, swear to tell the truth. I saw these things. And I heard them. What we see right there in those first few verses, I saw, I heard. That is eye gate and ear gate. He saw and heard it. He's telling you this is the truth. I didn't dream this. You know, there's always been a question, do you dream in color? Anybody know? You know, I can't even remember if I dream in color or not. But John describes colors vividly, doesn't he? This is not a dream. I saw and I heard. And when I, I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then he saith unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Boy, this is a tremendous revelation given here to John. He once again falls down flat on his face. This time it's before the angel. John did not mean to be disrespectful to God here. Don't, don't misinterpret. He is just so overwhelmed with everything that he's heard and everything that he's seen that he falls down on his feet before the messenger. And he's rebuked quickly and reminded the angels are not to be worshipped because they're like the saints. They're fellow servants. They're working for the Lord. You know, today people fall down, figuratively speaking, before a lot of different things. You know, a lot of people will worship angels and fallen angels and everything else. John was commanded, boy, this is important. Worship God. It doesn't say worship a God. It doesn't say worship gods. It says worship God. John, worship God. Don't worship angels, don't saints or prophets or Mary or anyone else. Worship God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Get up off of your face. If you're going to fall down before someone, fall down before God. Worship means basically to fall flat on your face before and that's what he wants. That's what, you fall before God, not me. Verse 10, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You know, Daniel, if you go back over to Daniel Chapter 12, verse 9, he is told see, uh, that he would be sealed till the time of the end. There was something God did not want to reveal. But John was told, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. John, what we tell you, what the Holy Spirit inspires you, write. People need to know this. It's important. It should be em emphasized though that the viewpoint of some scholars of Revelation is, oh, it's a, a puzzle that can't be put together and it's, oh, it, 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 it contradicts itself here and there. No, it doesn't. I heard a famous person one time who converted to Islam say, oh, the Bible, it, it just contradicts itself over and over. No, it doesn't. But if you read the Quran, you'll find that it does. The Quran does. It's plagiarized from the Bible. You know what it is about people who believe a lie but they won't believe the truth standing in front of them. You know, Revelation, both by its, uh, its plans, statements, and its symbols, is designed to reveal facts and events relating to the second coming of Christ. Its exhortation, which follows, has puzzles some. 
Those who are unjust and filthy, those who are wrong and vile, and vile are continued. Okay, go ahead. Continue to do so. And those who are righteous, those who do right, those who are holy, are encouraged to do the same thing. You know, the, the point here is not to condone evil, but the point is, is to point out that if people do not heed the prophecy, they're going to continue in their wickedness. Let those who want to be unjust, let them be unjust still. The one thing you find about God, He never makes you. He never breaks into your heart. You want unjust? Want to be filthy? Continue on your way. We have told you the truth. The truth is here. You don't want to change. That's your responsibility. You know, this suggests that in eternity, the unregenerate man will not experience a second chance for another nature. There was a fellow up in Salem who he might still be there. I don't know. He taught that after death, he had another chance to repent and be saved. Where in the world do you get these things? When you start messing with the Word of God, you're in deep trouble. I'm going to tell you right now, when you take that last breath and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, you are lost forever. The plain, simple truth. Once people are condemned at the great white throne, they will remain lost forever. There's no second chance. There's no second hope. How many chances do you think you have here? How many times did God call? How many times did the Holy Spirit work in your heart? On the other hand, those who heed the prophecy will continue to do right. They're going to continue to do what the Lord wants them to do. Relatively speaking now, the time of our Lord's return is, return is at hand. It's near. Uh, and no major changes in mankind's conduct can be expected. Man is going to be what man is. When I say relatively speaking, what God considers soon, quickly, is different from what we look at, as I said before. It's going to happen. It's going to happen soon, but don't put a date on it. It's at hand. You know, Jesus told them the kingdom of heaven was at hand, but He walked the earth. And it was. And it's still at hand for us. There's no hope for the wicked and the unrepentant sinner to change their hearts toward the Lord and the things of God. There's some who are just not going to do it. You won't do it? You know, it's like the old saying, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. I've seen that work over the years in this country. Verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Oh, the words which begin this verse, Behold, I come quickly, are the same that those begin verse 7. In connection with his return, which will be soon, a reward is promised to the saints for what they have done for Christ. Now, for what you have done for Christ, not for yourself to be seen, not to be patted on the back, but what you did for Him. And this reference is to the judgment seat of Christ. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where the believers will be judged according to what they did for the Lord, not their salvation. You're saved. That, this... The be I call it the bema seat of Christ. Judgment seat is the term in 2 Corinthians where we're judged for what we did for Him, received crowns or not. That's here. You're gonna, he's got his, the rewards are with Him. Whether we receive them or not depends on what we've done. You know, the final judgments of both the wicked and the righteous will be judgments of works. What have we done for the Lord to receive reward? Our salvation is already secured. But for the lost, as they stand at the great white throne, depending on their works to save them, they're going to find out that they don't. And they won't and they never could. And this is a joyful expectation of those who are faithful and it should be the fear of those who have not been faithful. After the rapture, all believers will face the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be held accountable for the way we served Him in this life. The rewards are different. We shall enter into heaven by faith in Christ, but faithful service 
in this life is the basis of how we'll be rewarded by Him in eternity. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. Just like A and Z is for the English alphabet. This is basically an incredible deity passage. Christ clearly is claiming the same attributes or perfections, if you will, of God the Father. Once again, Christ is described in His own, own words as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Christ is before all creation and He will continue to exist after this present creation is destroyed. He is the Eternal One. He is the Great I Am. When Moses asked at the bush that didn't burn up, the burning bush, who are you, basically? I am that I am. Which means the ever-existing one. What did Jesus just say right here? I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. I am is what Jesus just said. In John, seven times, He says, I am. He, and every time He said it, the religious leaders would pull their hair out. Blasphemy, blasphemy. He is just clearly stating, I am God. People tell me, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Read John. Read 22, 13 of, of Revelation. Read your Bible. There's no doubt the Messiah was to be God, the Almighty Father. And He, claimed, he tells you right here, plainly, I am. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates unto the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Here is the last of the seven Beatitudes of Revelation. Seven, the number of completion or perfection. Here's the seven. And it's bestowed on the saints who do His commandments. Again, this is encouraging. They have access to the new Jerusalem and of the tree of life. Six other Beatitudes, if you're interested, if you maybe you lost your notes there. Chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 14, verse 13. 16, 15. 19, 9. 26 and 22, 7 are your seven Beatitudes. In the manuscripts that followed by the King James expresses those who wash their robes is translated that do His commandments. In both cases, the words accurately describe the righteous. It's a wonderful thing. You ever thought about those white robes? They were picking on me this morning for wearing a kind of a white suit. I told them I sell them ice cream. Good human man. One day we're going to be wearing those white robes. In both cases, this accurately describes the righteous. But by contrast, judgment is pronounced on those who are unsaved. Dogs refers to people. You know, the Gentiles were looked on in the Old Testament as dogs. That's one of the things that makes it so incredible when she says, well, don't the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table? Aren't you glad we did? She, I mean, the, the, the lost, the Gentiles out there, don't we get those crumbs? The crumbs are great. That's Jesus Christ. You know, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware, you know, of all those things. The sorcerers, those conjurers, those who practice the magical arts, whoremongers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Anyone who loves and practices falsehood. They're outside. Not just outside the walls of the New Jerusalem. They're outside of salvation. These are the ones that never repented. These are the, the wicked. These are some of the sins. You know, there's a similar description given of the lost back in chapter 21. The wicked works which characterize the unsaved are described there too. 
These are what continues. And we see it today, don't we? Over and over again we see these things. Though some saints have been guilty of these practices. Well, I mean, we've, all, we've all done these things in the past. Most of them anyway. We've sinned. But the difference is we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb and we're now acceptable to God. But those who refuse to come to the Lord Jesus Christ receive the reward for their sins. You may not think of that as a reward, but it's what it is. I'm rewarding you, the Lord says, for what you want, your sins. Though the world is expressly wicked, God will bring every sin into judgment. And the time for Christ's return may be drawing near when this will be affected. It's coming soon. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you the things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The entire book of Revelation was delivered by Christ through his angel, and it is for the churches. Directly to those seven churches in Asia, Minor, to all churches then, to all churches today. Historically, Christ came from David. I think I mentioned when I started the morning's messages through Mark. Mark doesn't give genealogy because a servant doesn't need genealogy. But Matthew gives genealogy because he presents him as the Messiah, the King. And so we can trace him, his ancestry back through David. Prophetically, he's coming like the morning star, the beginning of a bright new day. The day like we've never seen before. So this verse is Jesus' seal of approval on the entire book of Revelation. It marks, by the way, the first use of the word church since chapter 3. Why? Why is there no reference to the church from chapter 4 up to here? Because we're in heaven. You see, the book is written to the churches. We're told about those seven churches. That's earthly. And then John said, is told to come up hither and the focus is then on the church in heaven. That's why we're never mentioned again by the name of the church until here. That's why there's no reference. The church has been raptured prior to the tribulation. It is in heaven, not on earth. We come back with the Lord at His second coming. And so Jesus is Lord and the offspring of David who gives us a shining hope because He's coming again. He's going to triumph over Satan completely, over suffering and death. He's already defeated them. Now He's going to assign them permanently away. No more. No more. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Here's the, you know, the same call we heard in Mark, isn't it? Come after me. Come. The Holy Spirit joined with the bride. That's the church now. The bride. In extending an invitation to all who will heed. You see, here's the church again, and what's it doing? The same thing it's supposed to be doing today. Calling people to follow Jesus. The wonderful promise is given for those who are thirsty. Come. And they will receive God's water of life freely. And wonderful. This is a wonderful invitation extended to every generation up to the coming of Christ. Right up to the second coming. It's available. Jesus clarified, clarifies the primary mission of the Spirit of the church, that is the bride, during the entire church age. Invite lost men and women to come to Him to, for salvation before it is eternally too late. Those who recognize their need and receive Christ is the, the, accept Him as the provider of salvation are exhorted to come while there is yet time before the judgment falls and it's too late. As Scripture makes it clear, the gift of eternal life, here it's called the water of life. It's been paid for by the death of Christ on the cross and it's extended to all who are willing to receive it by simple, simple faith. 
I might be a little long tonight. I want to finish up these verses if we can. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The invitation is extended out there to those who will listen, but here's a word of warning that's given to those who reject the revelation that's found in this final book of the Bible. The word uh, biblion, the Greek word translated Bible, uh, it's book, actually. It's where we get Bible from. Uh, it's a warning. It's a dual warning against adding to or subtracting from, from it. Some people said it's in regard to revelation only and not the entire Bible. I disagree. This is a warning not only for revelation, but from Genesis all the way through. Listen to Deuteronomy 4.2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish out from it, that ye may keep my commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. That's Deuteronomy. Don't do it. Don't add or take away. Deuteronomy 12, 20, 32. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto or diminish from it. Proverbs 36. Add thou not unto his words, lest ye provoke thee. He provoke thee and thou shalt be found a liar. And there are others. But I'm telling you, he's warning you, don't change the Word of God. What I talk about this morning, preach the Word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. God has spoken. It's Him. Listen to Him. And how great will be the judgment of those who despise this book and re relegate it to a mysterious experience of an old man and they were thereby denying the inspiration of the Word of God. Rejecting the Word of God is rejecting God Himself. And those who deny the promised, promises of blessing and subtract from His truths will receive a judgment and they will have no part in the tree of life or access to the holy city. Jesus warns against any who would deliberately add unto these things, meaning the prophecy of this book or the Bible as a whole or take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. Since Revelation is the completion of all biblical prophecy, you don't have any need for any more. I get so tired of people saying, well, you know, this is... And it's not in the Bible. They're adding to it. Instead, we need to study and to preach and to teach the prophecies that have already been given in Scripture as God gave them. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. One further word of testimony is given here. Surely I come quickly. And we would say that, yes, I'm coming soon. There it is. To this, John replied a brief prayer. He starts with, Amen. Let it be so. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And with the tremendous revelation completed, a final word of benediction is pronounced. The grace, the unmerited favor, the things we don't deserve of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And then the, the final word of the New Testament. Amen. The final word of the Bible. Let it be so. This expression is so common in the New Testament books, but it brings the Word of God to an end. There is no other word. No more. For those who believe that Christ in His first coming provided salvation, there's a wonderful promise of His coming again to bring full and final deliverance. As this book began by introducing a revelation of Jesus Christ, so it ends with the same thought that He's coming again and He's coming soon. Probably no other book of Scripture more sharply contrasts the blessed lot of the saints with a fearful future of those who are lost. No other book in the Bible is more explicit in the description of judgments on one hand 
and the eternal bliss of the saints on the other. And it's a tragedy. It really is a tragedy that so many pass by this book and fail to fathom its wonderful truths, thereby impoverishing their knowledge and hope in Jesus Christ. We need to exhort one another as St. Paul did in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Damned. You don't let him go. That means a maranatha also. It means the Lord's coming. God's people understand and appreciate these wonderful things, these promises, can join in the prayer of John. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, this book is so exciting and even the close of it, it excites us as we know that we are so close now to being with you for eternity. I want to lift up our prayer list to you before we close tonight, Father, once again, and ask that you would answer according to your perfect will and there's nothing more that we can ask than that. As we leave tonight, give us safety, guidance, and direction and allow us to be the best possible witnesses we can be for you, whether it's the spoken word or the way we live our life. And I thank you, Father, for the, all those blessings, for those who have been with us today, from our Sunday school time, which was wonderful, our morning service, and even now. I thank you for that privilege. And I pray in that name that's above all names, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm only a...